Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lakeview United Methodist Church here on this beautiful spring morning God's blessed us with. Pastor Ed is on vacation with Rita down south visiting family, and we're blessed to have Pastor Joy Aylmeyer. Allmeyer. Allmeyer from LaPorte with us again today. Morning uh, announcements this morning. For this week, Mary Magdalene Mission Circle will meet here on Tuesday night at 7. Church Ladies Lunch is this Friday at Leo's Restaurant at noon. Any of the ladies, come and join us. Indiana Camps and Retreats. Real fun, real... Just enjoy the camps. See Pastor Ed. Volunteers are needed for our Day of Prayer drive through on Thursday, May 2nd from 9 to 7. Sign up for a shift. Sign up sheets are on the round table, I believe in the back. We'll need lots of help for that. Anybody else have any other announcements? Sign up sheet on for fellowship time, bringing cookies and some juice. Um, that's on the bulletin board right outside the kitchen. I know it's kind of a week to week sign up, so sign up early so they're not worrying about it. Any other announcements? Okay. Good morning. So if I look like I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm doing. On summer break with the choir, so I didn't know I was supposed to process in. So you saw me all of a sudden gathering all my stuff, and then there, one of them's telling me, it's up to you, it's up to you. And I'm like, it doesn't say my name yet. So I don't think it's up to me. So um, thank you. I I'm already know that you're a kind church. You were so good to me last time. And there is just all these cute little notes everywhere. I don't know who the godly person is. God has a plan. Thank God he does, because I, I need his plan. And over here it says God has a plan, and over there it said God loves me, so I might want to go to that side instead. <laughs> but I love that. I love all these little notes, so thank you. Um, if you would join me now as we uh, turn over into the part time where we're going into the worship to prepare our hearts for worship. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for laughter, and I thank you that you can even use the awkwardness of a guest preacher to remind people that when new people come in, they don't know what they're doing. It's, it's awkward sometimes to walk into a new body, but Lord, I already sense your presence in this place. I see how much these people love you, and what a so much work that has gone into signage and, and just being a welcoming church, so thank you for that. Thank you for their pastor, and thank you for the time off that he's getting today. So as we join together in worship today, as we are here to experience you, to hear a word from you, to see you, I pray that you would begin to settle our hearts into praise through song, through thanksgiving, bring our concerns to you, our joys to you, so that, Lord, we know that we've been in your presence. So, Father, I thank you that where we may not know each other, you know us. You know us, and you see us, and you love us. And you do have a plan, so thank you for that. And all these things, we give you praise and thanks as we enter into a time now of singing and word. Be in all that we say and do. Amen. Please rise for the opening hymn, number 303, The Day of Resurrection.
please remain standing for the call to worship. How joyful it is to celebrate the good news of God's love. We are called to be Easter people. Darkness cannot claim us. Fear cannot bind us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. May the children come forward for the children's message. Where do you guys sit? Here? Here? Where are you sitting? Okay. <laughs> How are you guys this morning? Wonderful. I like that answer. Where you want to sit? You want to sit here? You want to sit here? I'll move over. Hi. <laughs> well, good morning. I'm excited to see all of you. I was so excited this last week I got to go see my grandchildren. Did you know I'm a grandma? But they don't call me grandma. You know what they call me? Nana. What do you call your grandma? Some grandmas are called Mimi's. Some are called Gigi's, Mamaw's, Grandma's. You have a Mimi? Okay. What's your grandma called? Do you have a grandma? No? <laughs> she says she doesn't have one. Who is her grandma? Grandma, you gotta know her. No, you are uh, your Nana. You have a Nana. Nana is a grandma too. I'm Nana. She's Nana. Yeah, I like it. Mm -mm, I got one. How about you? Do you have a grandma? <laughs> oh, your sisters. Do you also call them the same thing though? Okay, well, you know, sometimes we don't have the same names, do we? Do you know that, like, my husband, I have a granddaughter, her name's Katie Beth. You know what we call her? He calls her, he calls her Little Bit. Do you guys ever have nicknames? Yeah. Do you have a nickname? Yeah. You, you do? Ah. So this morning, I was going to talk to you a little bit about light. What's this? Flashlight. flashlight. When do you use a flashlight? When it's dark. When it's dark, you don't use it in the daytime? Why not? There's already light. You can already see. But sometimes when you have old eyes, you might need a light to see a little bit better. Because as you get older, sometimes your eyes don't see as well. What other kinds of lights do you see? What do you see? Is there some lights in here? Okay. Light bulbs. All right. What about when you're outside? What kind of lights do you see? Sunlight. What happened this week? Do you know what happened on Monday? The eclipse. That's when I went to Santa Claus to see with my grandkids. Did you, were you here in Lake, Lake, Lakeville? Is that what this is called, Lakeville? I wanted to say Lakeview, but Lakeville, because I saw a Lakeview church down there. So Lakeville, so did you stay here? Did you have school or did you get out of school for the day? You got out of school today so you could watch the eclipse? And did you see it? Did you have to look at it just like this? Did you just look up at the sky and watch it? You had to use something special. Why did you have to use something special? You could get blind looking at the sun too long, staring at it too long. <clears throat> okay, well, do you know, today I'm going to be talking about somebody who was eclipsed by light, and his name was Saul. And he had a name change after he had an experience of having his eyes blinded by looking at a light so bright. But that light came because he was going to kill Christians. It would be like somebody that had come from another city, and they wanted to kill us today. And God met him on the road. He thought he was doing the right thing because he was a person of prayer. He believed in God, but he didn't know who Jesus was yet. He didn't realize that Jesus really was God that had come to save us from our sins. So he thought he was doing the right thing, protecting the church. And so he was on his road to go arrest Christians and put them in jail. When all of a sudden, while he's on his horse, a giant light just shone on him. Whoa! Oh, it hurt my eyes. Yeah, right? Oh, no, I can't see. And so he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice, and the voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? They, other people heard a voice and saw a light, but they couldn't see a person. They didn't know what was happening. And Saul said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. And so, so and did you ever think about the fact that if you saw God directly, God is so beautiful and God is so much light that you might go blind? He went blind. God took away his sight for three days. What else happened at, at, at Easter time for three days? Do you remember? Yes, he was buried and was in the tomb for three days, right, before he rose again. 
And so he was transformed from this world to the next world, and then he comes back. And so the same was true of Saul. Saul then, all of a sudden, he said, I want you to go into the city, and I want you to wait there, and I'll tell you what you must do. So all of a sudden, could he see to get to the city? So what happened? How did he get there? How do you think he got there? If all of a sudden, Jesus, no, Jesus left. He was in the light, but he, he wasn't talking to him at that time. He had other people with him. Do you ever have to have other people lead you? Yeah, because maybe you don't know where you're going or you don't know what you're doing like me. They were trying to tell me, but I still made a mess of it because I didn't know when I was supposed to do something. I didn't know I was supposed to walk in. So sometimes we need somebody to lead us. So he had to have the soldiers who were with him, who were working with him. They had to lead him. And when they went to lead him and they took him to the city, for three days he was just in darkness. What would it be like not to be able to see anymore? If you, all of a sudden, everything was dark. What do you think that would be like? Have you ever known anybody who was blind? We've never known anybody who was blind? We had a young man at camp who was blind. And my husband let him drive the golf cart, scared me to death. <laughs> yeah, everybody was saying, what are you doing? And he would just tell him, turn right, turn left, slow down, stop. But yeah, I thought it was crazy. But Drew had a great time. Nobody ever let him drive before blind. Well, there's a reason for that, yeah. So sometimes, sometimes we think we know what is right, and God has to show us, or our parents, or a teacher say, you know, that wasn't good what you just did. Have you ever had anybody correct you? Oh, she's hiding behind her pig. She's eclipsed by a pig this morning. Now we see you, just like the sun peeking out behind the moon, Yeah. And so if you think you're right about something, is it hard to change your mind? I'm sure I'm right. And then you're shocked when you find out you're not. Well, that was the way it was with Saul. He was shocked. He wasn't right. And so Jesus said, you weren't being right. You weren't doing the right things. So Saul had to pray and pray for three days. And then Jesus told somebody to come and to heal his eyes. But that person was afraid to go because he knew who this man was. If he opens his eyes, what's he might do to me? I'd arrest me. But God said, don't worry about it. He's not going to arrest you. You go and you trust that this man is going to be changed now. He's now going to be your friend instead of your enemy. Have you ever had somebody who wasn't your friend that became your friend later? Me too. Isn't that a great thing when somebody becomes your friend that wasn't before? Well, let's pray that as you grow up, if something maybe you're taught or something you think is right is not right, that God will show it to you, okay? Because I have to ask God to show me all the time, was I right when I did that or did I do something wrong and I need to apologize for it? Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for these beautiful children and thank you so much for the eclipse that we got to witness. Lord, I know when I witnessed the eclipse, I felt the air change. It was cold for a little bit. And yet we were busy watching the wonder and not realizing that sometimes, Lord, things in our life eclipse things. We think we are so right about something like Saul did, only to find out that we were displeasing you by our actions. So, Lord, I pray for these children. I pray that they will always know what is right and good, that you will help when they stray a little bit or do something that isn't good, that the parents and grandparents in this church who has promised to raise them up to know you will help them to know what is right and lead them in the right way. And so God, make us be teachable. Continue to teach me when I'm wrong to say I'm sorry and when I do bad things to be willing to be changed by you. Thank you, Lord, for your love because you only do this because you love us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you all. It was nice to meet you. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that we have received from your hand. We know that all the work that we've done and all the gifts that we've been given from doing that work are from your hand. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for providing for us this week. Thank you that you are our provision. So, Lord, please accept back these tithes and these offerings to you. May they be used for your kingdom and for a way that will honor and further the work that you want to do in sharing the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. (laughs) You may be seated. As we continue in an attitude of prayer, are there those that we should be praying for this morning? Hope. Hope is having surgery tomorrow. Okay. Yes? Who was the second one? Jean. And your brother's first name? Gary. Gary? Okay. All right. Are there others? Yes. Lori? Okay. Are there others? Bill Murphy. Bill Murphy? Okay. Any others back here? Got my back to you, so. All right. Well, let's be in prayer for Israel and Iran and all of that conflict that's happening uh, currently in the news, as well as all the other places that war is still happening in the world, in Ukraine and, and other places that are just being ravished by war and have been and never make the news, um, different places in Africa and places like that. So let's, let's not forget um, that there are Christians suffering in the world and um, as well as others who don't know Christ. Are there others? Okay, Um, if you would join me at a moment of silence, and then um, I will uh, say a prayer, and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Lord, as we come before your throne, we are told we can say, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, that you love us that deeply, that we can run to you even though you're the King of kings and Lord of lords. We can come to you and chatter away like we do to a grandparent or a parent at the end of a day, telling them all the joys and all the sorrows, the things we've learned, You love to hear from your children. So thank you. Thank you that you wait and listen. And then you hope that we'll wait and listen too. And not just be a one-way conversation. Lord, I'm so guilty sometimes. Of not approaching you with thankfulness first. And saying, what a good God you are. We take all the things for granted being able to walk, being able to drive 30 minutes to come to a different church, having had a bed to sleep in last night, food, more than I need. Sometimes, Lord, we focus on the negatives rather than the positives, so forgive us for that. For any unkind words we've spoken or words that we didn't mean to be unkind, but were taken that way, Lord, we ask that you would cover that multitude of sin or the thoughts that we didn't say out loud, but you heard. We filtered them, but they still were growing in our hearts. So Lord, we do come to you this morning and we thank you for your mercy, for your love, that encounter of love like none other. We ask that your love would fall upon us this morning so that we don't have to be ashamed We just need to be changed. (laughs) Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the music this morning. What a gift. What a gift this pianist is to this church, to my heart this morning. 
for the message that comes through music touches like none other. And Lord, knowing that you are a good God and have suffered, you understand the suffering that some of our family and friends are going through. You understand our grief and you walk with us through that if we allow you to. So open our eyes to the places you're going to walk with all the persons mentioned this morning. And we ask that we as your people would know how to send a text or a phone call or a card to encourage Hope, Jean, Gary, Bill, and Lori. And all the ones that are unspoken, but everybody knows they need an encouraging word. Thank you that we have community, that we can support each other and lift each other up and remind each other when we're too tired we can hold each other's hands up or be your hands and feet to them. So Lord, hear our prayers and help us to be still and know that you are God, a loving God. And now Lord, remind us, remind us that we also need to be taught how to pray. <laughs> So continue to teach us, Lord, how to pray as you did the disciples when they asked Jesus. Teach us to pray and hear our voices join with theirs through the ages as we say the prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Today's reading comes from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, and then Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners through Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led, led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I am currently taking classes for License to Preach. My husband is an elder in the United Methodist Church, and this is going to be really strange. I'm going to feel like I have to do this once in a while. So um, my husband is an elder in the United Methodist Church, which means... He's been through seminary, he's had all the classes, he's done all of that, he's struggled with his theology, and he knows what he believes. Um, well, I think I know what I believe, because I was raised Southern Baptist, so I'm sure I know what I believe, you know? And so oftentimes, how we're raised is how we view the world, is it not? If you are raised in the South, you may view things a little differently. For instance... Um, when I would go to the South, every year my father would make this trek because it, we're like homing pigeons. I have a homing pigeon in me that takes me to Hammond all the time when we'll go on a trip. It's like I want to stop by Hammond and see it. But my folks all came from Alabama, and they were transplants to the Gary area because of the coal mines. The coal mines would shut down, many of you remember, and migration of the South would come to fill those jobs at the factories until the coal mines would open back up and they would go home. And so my father uh, always felt guilty about the fact, and his siblings always kind of laid a guilt trip on him, that the last time he came to stay, he had six children. I was not born yet. And he had six children and a wife who had cancer and uneducated, didn't have, couldn't read or write. <laughs> so he, had, he didn't want to give up that job. He knew his family needed a better life. And so he chose to stay the last time that they migrated and they all went home. So every year we would go home for the decorating of graves. Now, that's not something I ever saw here. Do you all decorate graves here? I meant ritualistically, does this church have a big shindig once a year? You all come together and you go out and you decorate the graves and you have a big meal on the gravesite over there with like a giant table and you have a big picnic. And you always have your picture taken at the grave with your grandma and grandpa who's already gone and you're all gathered around it. I wish I'd have brought some pictures. You, wouldn't, you would be shocked. <clears throat> um, and so I grew up thinking that's where you did family photos. You do them at the <laughs> gravesite. Right? Because once a year, we didn't have money. We didn't go to Ola Mills. I think maybe we went to Ola Mills twice in my life, but I was a lot older then. We went to the grave, and everybody had their picture. And I still remember the pictures would hang in my aunts and uncles' houses. Before my grandmother passed, my dad's mom, she was holding her little dog over the picture of the grave. And so all my memories were of having your, I thought that was normal. You had your family photos taken at the graves because you remember grandma and grandpa are still on them and everybody else. And so there were other little things, like even moving from Hammond to Columbus, Indiana. So when I was 16, or almost 16, 15, so I was raised a Yankee. You know, I was the only Yankee in the family born actually in the North. 
And so my, my fa family, when my dad had black lung from the coal mines, he got really sick. He couldn't keep working. So by my age, he was very sick. Um, it's hard to believe now when I think back about that, that I'm older than my dad was when he was so sick with black lung. And so he couldn't handle the pollution anymore of, up here. So he went home for about a year, and my mother stayed here running a business, and then eventually they decided to get back together. But they didn't know where they were going to go, because she didn't want to go back to the South. She had been away for 30-something years. All her grandchildren were now up here. And he didn't want to live up here. So I had one brother that lived in Columbus, Indiana. And so when we made the trek, and I was 15 going on 16, wasn't too happy about it, finally had found my way up the social elite ladder, only to be busted back down and go to a middle class community. Now, I'd never seen eyes odds. I didn't know why everybody was wearing alligators on their shoes, shirts or boat shoes. Everybody kind of dressed the same. I was like, I didn't know where I was. And everybody was white. And I'm like, what? In Hammond on my street, everybody wasn't white. It just seemed very strange. Even to the point that my language was different. Like, I would say things like, psych, meaning just kidding, right? Do you guys still say that, or is that an old thing? Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And they would look at me like I was from a foreign planet, like I was an alien. They didn't use that. So even my speech, even in the state of Indiana, we were that different from the north to the south. So much so that my husband swore he would never, ever, ever, ever cross that invisible line of 465. He would never move north, ever, ever, ever. God has such a sense of humor moving us north, moving us to the region again. And so I'd warned my husband, you know, don't look at people, don't look them in the eye, they don't look you in the eye because they'll kill you. You know, I mean, in my neighborhood, that's the way it was. My neighborhood, you didn't, you went to the grocery store, you never saw anybody you knew, you know, and you definitely didn't look people in the eye till you got to know them. You know, and I go to the south and they're waving at you. Hi. I'm like, do I know you? No, why are you waving at me? And so when my husband came for his take-in, he was prepared for this, and then he found everybody to be super friendly just in the South. And he's like, you lied to me, and he told on me to the people. I could have killed him. He said, my wife told me you all were going to be very nice. You were going to look me in the eye like they do in the South. So imagine, have you ever changed your mind about something? Have you ever changed your mind about something? It's harder as we get older, isn't it? So much so that we don't know how to talk to each other anymore. In the Methodist Church, outside in politics, we are so set in our ways and in our thinkings that even in the Methodist Church, we had to come up with Christian conferencing guidelines. Do you have them posted in your church? Big thing in the conference, the whole conference, several years ago, wanted every church to know these and wanted them hanging in your church. So I guess not. None of you know. Not hanging here? Y'all don't need them because y'all get along, right? <laughs> never any disagreements in this church, right? <laughs> never, never. Well, good. I get to share with you a Methodist thing. So it says, according to John Wesley, this is one of the means of grace. When we get together, we conference. We talk to each other. Others that he, include, he included were prayer, searching, <clears throat> searching the scriptures, sorry, and receiving the Lord's Supper, or some of us call that communion. Sorry, I've got a dry throat. So the guidelines, number one is respect others as Jesus would have done when he was here on earth. Some of these sound obvious, but they're not for Christians anymore. Two, pray for others as well as yourself, especially those with whom you disagree. Is that the first thing you do when you meet somebody you don't like? One of those Christians, you know, sitting in the board meeting with you that have a different opinion of what we should do with that money? Do you go home and immediately start praying for them? And if you do, how do you pray? <laughs> Lord, strike them down. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> listen. Listen to others before thinking about what you want to say in response. That's a hard one for me. I thought they were stupid in the South because they couldn't talk and listen at the same time. Up North, we talk over each other. In a big family, you know, I'd be saying something and my brother would be saying something. We'd be talking at the same time. And I went to the South and they were all of a sudden like, and they wouldn't speak until you were done talking. And I'm like, are you that slow? You can't think and talk at the same time? I don't know. For understand what others are saying so clearly that you could state their point of view. That I listened so well to what you had to say that I could then tell you, well, this is why he thinks we shouldn't spend the money this way because of blah, 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 blah. 
Share your own point of view with grace and humility, as well as honesty and candor. Then focus six, your comments on issues being discussed, not on persons expressing them. Seven, commit yourself to the unity of the spirit, seeking consensus whenever possible. Eight, give the time needed to work through the process in which you are engaged. Nine, oh, this one. This one for me was hard. I'm still working on it. Acknowledge. You may be wrong even when you think you're right. You may be wrong even when you think you're right. If you think you're right, you usually don't want to admit you're wrong, right? I could be wrong. Allow 10, the fruit of the Spirit, to permeate your way of interacting with others. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the reason I was talking about this is because of number nine. Acknowledge, you may be wrong even when you think you are right. Did we not just hear the scripture say to us that Saul was so sure he was right? The Jews were so sure they were right about Jesus blaspheming the name of God by claiming to be God. That they became so angry because they were so entrenched They could not see that that which they had hoped for, that which they had been teaching as teachers of the law, was finally in their midst. And they became so angry that they killed him and asked for a murderer to be let free instead of Jesus when he could have had a scapegoat and Pilate tried to let Jesus free. And instead, they cry out, Barabbas, Barabbas, a notorious murderer to go free and kill an innocent man, all because they thought he was blaspheming God by claiming to be God. They were wrong, weren't they? It was proved after Jesus rose from the dead, so much so that a centurion at the foot of the cross falls and said, surely this was the Son of God, surely. As the night, as the day grew dark during the day, like our eclipse, as the temple the curtain was torn in two, and the Holy of Holies was opened, and now the Spirit of God didn't just reside behind a curtain that only a few could go into, but now he was going to send his Holy Spirit to live with us. And so Saul was not this horrible Barabbas that was released. Saul was a devout follower, follower of the Jewish God, Yahweh. He really believed what he was doing was right. He was trying to preserve the faith trying to preserve the old ways of the church. Can't change anything, you know. Can't do that, don't dare. So he really thought he was right. And so he was so zealous for God to protect God's name, to protect God's teachings of the Jews that he decided he would help. Do you remember the first time we ever hear of Paul? I'm sorry, that's his new name, Paul, Saul. Where's the first time we hear of Saul in the Bible? It's only one other time before the scripture we read today. It was still in the book of Acts. It was earlier. Where was he? Anybody remember? Yes, at the stoning of Stephen, the very first martyr that we're told of in the Bible. He was holding the coats of those who would go to stone and put Stephen to death. And it says in Acts, he approved of this. He approved of it. Although Stephen is standing there and he doesn't fight back and we hear even the words almost of Christ, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And God is about to forgive Saul, isn't he? And use him as his own vessel. And so here we have Saul. We've seen him once as a young man holding all the coats of the Pharisees. There at the stoning of Stephen, still thinks he's right, going to go out and hunt down all the other people to kill him. Least likely person you would think to lead the New Testament, isn't it? lead the New Testament church, least likely candidate. Think of the most unusual person in our society right now that God might use to become your leader, that you're to love. Can you think of somebody? Don't name them. Don't say it out loud. I didn't mean that. That was like a think, not say. And so we find Saul, and he's on the road, And he's blinded. You know, I couldn't help but think of that when we were watching the eclipse. Have you ever been eclipsed by something that made everything, the sun quit shining in your life? Grief, 
Anybody had somebody they love die and the grief just so overwhelms you that you just feel darkness over you? I have. I have. Pain. You get older. You're in a, my mother, I watched my mother suffer a little bit there at the end. For her. She said, why is it so hard to die? She said that to my brother. Why is this so hard to die? A godly woman that I expected God would just like take her up easy and she had to suffer some at the end. I didn't understand that. I struggled and it almost like blotted out the light of the joy of my heart watching that for a season of my life. There's lots of things that eclipse. Sometimes in my life, do you know one of the things that will eclipse my family? Money, a car would break down. And we were poor. And when my father died, it was even harder as my husband and I struggled because my father knew how to work on cars. My husband did not. My father would drive all the way from Indiana to the Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where my husband was a soldier, so we wouldn't get taken by somebody telling us that our car was broke down and had this problem charging us lots of money. He would drive all the way to Kentucky to get our car and tell them, shame on you, and then he would fix it for us. And so when he died, that eclipse, that darkness, began to cover the sun of the joy of my life because our car would break down and we had no money and I didn't know what to do. I didn't have anybody looking out for us anymore. And so church, those are places in young people's lives when they're struggling, that you can be there for them, that you can let the light shine again by picking up when they don't have anybody to walk with them. Sometimes it's a baby that won't quit crying and you're a young mom and you just don't know what to do because they're colicky. And if you don't have a mom to call, you need somebody in the church to fill that role. Love can heal so many things. And Saul got to experience that so much that this very person who was murdering, going to murder people, that was approving of the murder of Stephen, God was going to put a calling on his life and he was going to have to suffer for the gospel. And he is the one we quote at weddings, right? Corinthians, the love chapter, he got eclipsed by love. Just like darkness and suffering can eclipse you, so can the goodness of God. And so I, I love the way one person suggested in a reading this week, he suggested that what Paul felt when that light came upon him was overwhelming love of Jesus. And did you notice the words of Jesus that he said to him? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute? Who did he say? You remember what we read? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute Christians? Me. No, he said, why do you persecute me? You see... Whatever happens to the church, whatever happens in your life, happens to Jesus. He identifies with you. You identify in him. We are in him. And so when we hurt another brother or sister in Christ, guess who we're hurting? We're hurting God, the heart of God, the very heart of God. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the love of God swept over him, and he could no longer see straight. And he's led, and he says he doesn't eat or drink, and he prays. And he's praying to God, and Jesus then is revealed to him. Now, later in Galatians, we saw Paul write. What did it say? He said, this gospel, this good news that I'm sharing with you, it didn't come to me by human revelation. It came from God. It was revealed to me by God himself. What I am sharing with you today, I wasn't smart enough to know on my own. <laughs> Actually, I was living contrary to it. If Saul can be changed, if his heart can admit that he was wrong <laughs> and he can be changed, how much more so us, church? How much more should we be willing to be eclipsed by the love of God so that we are so transformed that everyone who comes into contact with us feels loved? Feels loved. Do you feel loved today? We have a society, young people, especially. So many of them, you know, are older people a lot of times, they move to Florida. <laughs> and I've always questioned that. You know, it's not that I think it's wrong. I get it the older I get because I like the sunshine and it feels better and I need the sunshine. But there's a part of me that says when I leave behind any influence over children and grandchildren and all of that, we're missing unless I take them with me. <laughs> 
How are you loving people today? Are you feeling loved? Because a lot of times we don't sit long enough in the presence of God to feel loved. But I guarantee it, if you sit and you seek, the Bible says, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So those moments when darkness eclipses my life, when my mother's suffering, when I'm watching her die, when I'm filled with grief over that, when I'm sitting with a family whose child was killed outside our church as they're trying to do something good for the church and plan vacation Bible school and a ball falls into the street and the brother thinks he can see he's standing on the hill and his brother gets killed because an unexperienced driver went over to the other side seeing this child and kills it. Where's God? Where's God? You see, that was so hard that some of the young people of the church said, well, obviously, if God let this happen to their child, they're probably going to let it happen to mine, so they quit coming. But the family who lost the child, they knew God's goodness, and he was with them through all of that, crying with them, weeping with them. They didn't leave. They didn't leave. They stayed next to God's heart, working through that. But it's tempting, isn't it? It's tempting when the darkness closes in for us to give up hope. You got a person named Hope, needs prayers, going through a dark time, going to have surgery, but has the perfect name for such a time as this. Remind her of that. Remind her that her name is Hope. There's hope. There's hope. You see, when I was a child, I got a new name. Saul got a new name. Saul's name became what? Paul. That's how we know Paul. My name was Stinker when I was born. <laughs> Until I got old enough to talk and say, I'm not, I don't stink. But my mother did not want or need a child in her life when I was born. Life was hard. They were poor. They were coming out of poverty. They had six children already from 20 to 11 years old. They did not need a baby. In fact, they weren't even getting along and had separated after they found out, before they found out she was pregnant with me. He had mumps, she had had an ovary taken out, neither of them should have been able to have children. But in the midst of her sorrow, she decided to name me Joy in hopes that that's what I would become. You named her Hope so that she would become Hope and have hope. I was named Joy so that I would become a Joy, a promise of what God would do so much so that when I read a letter from her, it was hard. As she was in a nursing home for a little bit, and I'm taking care of her, and I open up the file cabinet drawer, and I'm going through her stuff to prepare for what was coming, I find a letter to my daughter. She has two daughters, but it was quickly evident which daughter she was writing to, about how if abortion had been legal at that time, she would have probably gotten an abortion, and about how the difficulties that they were going through in life and how hard it was. But yet God gave grace and God changed the circumstances so much that she says, do you wonder sometimes when I see you preach why I get tears in my eyes or I hear you sing? Because I remember that I had lost a little hope. I forgot and yet God was good. God was good through all of that. We need to quit judging each other and we need to start loving each other more. And we need to start praying a whole lot more for each other <laughs> and not for bad things to come, but praying that God would transform me to understand you a little better or to change our hearts so that we can find a way through this ever-evolving society that is swirling around us that we don't understand and let God say, God, I acknowledge this morning, I could be wrong, so change me. I wrote a prayer. Let's see if I can find it. My prayer after being struggling with this, let's see, I know I brought it. My chicken scratch. So here's the prayer that I wrote that I'll leave you with. After thinking about all of this, after struggling with acknowledging I could be wrong about a few things in my faith. Oh, do you know what your pastor is doing on Wednesday nights? You probably don't, do you? Because I don't see any of you online with us. Your pastor and my husband have very different theological ideas. 
but they've been friends for years. Ed was a college student at our church when we were at Mount Vernon, so we know him when he was a youth. They, Ed joins Tim, and we're doing social resolutions, and we're going through different social resolutions. He joins online. We have about 30 people from our church that sit in, and then we have a man from Illinois that joins us from another church that we knew him from to talk about So Ed will give his opinion about a social resolution. Tim will give his opinion about the social resolution, usually on opposite sides of the fence. And they model for the people, how do we agree, how do we disagree agreeably and still love each other and still are good friends and have open conversation and talk about where we agree and where we don't agree. And so they're modeling for the church the behavior of how do we talk about these things on Wednesday nights. And so I just didn't know if you knew that we are in a collaboration with your pastor about that. So my prayer was, Lord, help me. Correct my thinking, my hearing, and my vision. I don't want to be a zealous Pharisee protecting religion or a stumbling block to those who encounter me on their journey. If necessary, blind me by your light of love that I might, for a time, sit in the darkness to be still contemplate, pray, and await your healing and opening of my eyes to a new transformation and a purposeful life, one that loves and lives like you. I want to go from Saul to Paul, stinker to joy. (laughs) Amen. Um, It's time for the next hymn, hymn number 310, He Lives. He lives. Please stand.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May God be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.